Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to take a pretty close look at recalculating recombination frequencies based on how often crossing over takes place. Okay, now before we can jump into this, please remember these facts that a stem cell, for example, a cell inside of an ovary or a cell inside of a testis, is getting ready to go through meiosis. It's going to start out as a diploid cell, and when it completes meiosis, it's going to make haploid gametes. Okay, diploid cells have two copies of each gene, one on each homologous chromosome. Okay, we call each of these copies alleles, and they can be alike or they can be different. Right before meiosis begins, the chromosomes are replicated, which means each chromosome is then made up of two identical sister chromatids. And finally, during prophase one of meiosis, tetrads form, and chromatids that are really close together that are not homologous to each other can cross over, which means they can trade their tips. All right, so let's look at a situation here where we have a gene where we have, sorry, we have a chromosome with two linked genes. So this is a chromosome right here, okay, and this is its homologous chromosome here. And the, geno the genotype for this organism is big A little a, big B little b. So it's a dihybrid. And because it has two chromosomes, we can say its 2n number is 2. So here's one of the chromosomes. And here's the other chromosome, all right? Now we're going to take this cell through interphase, and each of the chromosomes are going to duplicate themselves. So what we end up with over here now is one chromosome with two identical chromatids and the other chromosome with the same situation, two identical chromatids. This little dot right here represents the centromere. All right, now we're going to go through meiosis one, and what's going to happen is the homologous pair is going to separate. So in this picture, we have I've drawn a circle around it to represent one cell and another circle here to represent the other cell. And notice that now each cell only has one chromosome in it, so they're now haploid. Now meiosis two is going to separate the sister chromatids. So these two sister chromatids are going to separate, and over here, these two sister chromatids are going to separate. So what we end up with, because there is no crossing over, all right. Um, in this example, for there's no crossing over, we end up with one set of gametes right here that are just like one of the parents. So we call these parental because they're big A, big B. And we have another possibility over here from the other cell, which is little a, little b. So that's the other parental chromatid. chromatid. Notice, okay, this is real important, that there are no recombinants, which means there are no gametes possible that are big A, little b, or little a, big B, which would be the, the recombinants. They're not possible. Now, if the genes are linked and there's no crossing over, this is what a test cross would look like. So here is the genotype of the one, the one we just looked at on the previous slide, and we're going to cross it with a completely recessive individual. Whenever you do this, it's called a test cross. All right, so this individual can make two different gametes, okay, big A, big B, or little a, little b, all right. Now remember, because the genes are linked, okay, they're linked, so we can't put a big A and a little b together, because remember, the big A and the big B are on the same chromosome, so they can't get away from each other, all right. So this individual here can make this gamete or this gamete, and of course, we only have one possible gamete from this individual here. So the offspring out of 100, we're going to predict we're going to get half of them are made by combining this gamete and this gamete, and the other half is going to be made by combining this gamete and this gamete. So we can have little a, little a, little b, little b, or big A, little a, big b, little b, which look just like the parents. See, see why we call these um, parental. Okay, the genotypes of these individuals are parental genotypes because they look just like the parents. There are no recombinants, okay? So if we calculated it, number of recombinants is zero divided by 100 offspring, so we have no crossing over happening. All right, now, what if the genes are linked and we have all of them crossing over? Exact same situation, okay? We have two chromosomes. One's carrying big A, big B, and one's carrying little a, little b. We go through... Um, replication, so now we have two chromatids for each of them. We go through um, prophase one of meiosis, and this is where we get crossing over. And I've tried to represent that here by crossing over these two chromatid ends here. So what you end up with is an original, okay, it's like we just started with, but 
the other chromatid is no longer identical. Because of the crossover now, this one's carrying a little b. And the big b jumped over here. So now we have parental, parental, okay? And inside here, we have the two recombinant chromatids, okay? Um, then that arrow there is wrong. The recombinant one should be right here. So ignore that. All right, so do you see the difference between recombinant chromatids and the parental chromatids? Okay, so if the genes are linked and there's 100% crossing over, this is what you're going to end up with. You're going to get, okay, just like we got before, the two parental, um, this is, excuse me, let me get rid of that. We have the two parental possibilities for gametes, plus we have two recombinant possibilities. And for this one, just like before, there's only one possibility. Now, there's four ways you can combine these, and they're of equal probability. So we're going to get an equal probability of a parental, a parental, and a recombinant, and a recombinant. So we have 50 recombinants out of 100 offspring, so we've got 50% crossing over. All right? Um, so at least 50%. So if all of them cross over, what you can't really anything above 50% really doesn't make sense because... Once you get past half of them crossing over, um, I'll show you in a, in a future slide what that looks like. All right, so if 50% or more of these original cells that are going through meiosis are crossing over, then the recombinants turn out to be just as likely as the parental pheno, uh, genotypes. So statistically, gene A and gene B, gene B behave just like they were not linked. So that's what I've drawn up here. Okay, we have one gene carrying A another little a, and on a completely separate gene, we have the b's. So you can see here is as you go through the replication, and they're unlinked, they behave like independent particles. That's much more like what Mendel explored with his pea plants. All right, now, the farther apart two loci are, remember loci is the location of genes on a chromosome, the farther apart two loci are, the more likely a crossover event will occur between them. So you notice here gene A has a loci right here, and gene B has its locus right here. There's a lot of real estate between them, so it's, there's a lot of places for a crossover break to take place. So that means gene A and gene B are very likely to cross over, all right? Whereas gene C and D here, okay, are close together, so there's only a few, there's much less real estate here for the break to take place, so much less likely for a crossover event to take place between C and D. Now, Morgan's team used the frequency of recombinations to map the locations of genes within the fruit fly genome. But just remember, the, this, these gene maps that Morgan's lab produced only show relative location, locations, not actual locations on the chromosome. So, for example, he could figure out that um, the gene controlling short antennae was closer to the gene controlling wing shape than it was to the gene controlling leg shape. But he couldn't actually figure out where they were located on the chromosome. He could only figure out the relative distances. So for example, he would do that by, by doing crosses between plants that had, excuse me, between fruit flies that had um, the mutant antennae and the mutant wings, and he would find that this has 13% recombination. So that's the recombination frequency. So that's how he would decide that these are 13 map units apart. Whereas the recombination frequency between the short antennae and short legs is 31 map units apart. Okay, so he would get 31% crossing over between those two. All right, now um, if he did a comparison between short arist the short antennae and purple eyes, you notice that's over 50 map units apart. So these are if this is going to cross over so much that you can't really tell for sure that they're on the same chromosomes, on the same chromosome by comparing the purple eye gene to the Aristi one. But you can tell on they're on the same chromosome by comparing it to a closer one. All right. So I'm hoping that makes sense. But between these, you can figure out the different map units. So for example, between the gray body, the gene controlling the body color, and the gene controlling purple versus red eyes, we have a distance here that is equal to 54.5 minus 48.5. So that would be the, the predicted percent recombination between these two. So I'm hoping this helps you make sense of what's meant by recombination frequencies and how Morgan's team figured out how to um, map the location of genes without actually being able to, to image them or to um, decode them, like we're going to learn about in our next unit of study on the molecular basis of inheritance. Thanks for listening.